Hey everybody, um, I'm also Michael. Um, I'm Michael Ching and I'm a staff engineer on the database engineering team at Shipt. Um, and recently our infrastructure group um, went through a project to identify a multi-region highly available data store uh, for our critical workloads. Um, it's true that we've been using Cockroach for a couple of years for our payment solution, uh, payment pr um, processing app, um, but we really wanted to take it a step further um, with this project because um, we had an event that uh, caused us to ha have compromised availability for our PostgreSQL databases. So today I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, but since we're really at the beginning of our journey with CockroachDB, uh, I'm gonna talk less about operating at scale or performance tuning and more about uh, why this was a need for our company and what happened to send us on this journey. I'm also gonna talk about what our criteria was for identifying uh, the right solution and uh, how we chose CockroachDB. Uh, also, where we are now and some lessons that we've learned along the way. So first, some facts about Shipt. Um, Shipt is a same-day delivery provider of groceries and consumer goods. Uh, the company was founded in 2014 and acquired by Target Corporation in 2018. And we experienced tremendous growth, uh, just like most delivery companies did during the pandemic. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that Target actually acquired a same-day delivery platform in 2018. So when the pandemic happened, uh, they were ready to hit the ground running and didn't have to stand up a same-day delivery uh, platform you know, under duress. Um, so in addition to um, delivering Target orders, we also work with over 120 partners um, across the city, across the country, retail partners um, in more than 5,000 cities. And we have more than 300,000 shoppers who work to pick and shop orders and get them delivered to our customers. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what our previous target architecture was for critical databases. Um, it was your typical active-passive configuration uh, with a primary database defined in our cloud, uh, main cloud region and a standby database defined in our passive uh, standby region. Um, I should mention that it shipped. Um, our business workloads follow closely with traditional retail patterns, and this means that uh, the holiday shopping period at the end of the year is our peak season, uh, and that means that uh, uptime during this period is absolutely crucial. So um, last year, many of you probably experienced something similar. Uh, during our peak season, our cloud provider suffered a number of regional outages in our main cloud region. And um, one event actually compromised the operation of most of the critical services that we were running in that region. Um, so in that event, our plan is to fail over our main uh, primary database from our cloud region to our standby region. Um, and ideally, you don't want to perform these failovers until you know what your replication lag is. You want it to be as low to zero, as close to zero as possible to ensure a lar low RPO. So our experience during this outage exposed lots of assumptions that we were making um, about how our failover plan would work and also some complications uh, with failing over lots of critical services from one region to another. So the first uh, complication that we sort of ran into was that failing over database services and services from one region to another requires lots of manual intervention. Um, and this opens the door to human error and indecision. So um, another, another complication that we noticed uh, when we were uh, trying to put our failover plan into action was that um, during the most severe cloud outage, um, the, the, we had several cloud services that were degraded, including networking and the control console. So it was hard to gauge what our replication lag metrics even were, um, which made it hard to uh, gauge what our RPO would be if we did a failover. Um, and next, um, so it turns out lots of services uh, that we needed to fail over may have dependencies on other services that may not be able to tolerate a failover to another region. Um, I call this dependency untangling, um, and it, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out uh, what could fail over and what couldn't sort of on the fly, and it further delayed our decision to utilize our failover strategy. And finally, if you are able to check the first three boxes, um, it's always possible that provisioned resources in your standby region don't match what you had provisioned in your um, main region, like storage, um, CPU, and memory. 
or that network routing rules are not configured um, to allow uh, communication to your internal network resources and also to external service providers. So our experience um, with this cloud regional failure highlighted our need for database resilience um, and drove the creation of a new initiative at Shipped to identify a platform uh, for highly available database uh, services. So uh, these are a few of the requirements that we had. Uh, we evaluated against um, several products. The first of those is that obviously it needed to be a multi-region uh, configuration. Um, also, it needed to offer an active-active configuration for multi-region rights. Um, I have that in quotes, or it's supposed to be in quotes. Um, so it turns out that we thought we wanted active-active, but Cockroach uh, DB is actually providing something a little bit different. Um, I'll talk about that later. So at Shipped, we've uh, used managed uh, services for our database um, products for years, and so that was one of our requirements, was that we were looking for something that was a managed uh, solution. The solution also needed to offer auto failover in the event of um, zonal or regional uh, infrastructure failures. Um, next, it needed to be hosted in our preferred cloud and cloud region. Um, so we have our uh, apps uh, obviously um, provisioned in a certain cloud, and we wanted them to be co-located with the um, database solution that we chose. Um, the solution also needed to offer low or no downtime maintenance um, for mi minor and major version upgrades and also for patching and things like schema changes. Um, next, the solution needed to offer ACID compliance with strong support for transactions and strong consistency. And finally, the uh, solution needed to uh, be syntactically similar with common relational databases like Postgres uh, with minimal schema changes for uh, migrations and support for common drivers and schema management tools. Um, so we evaluated several options against our requirements and, and ended up choosing uh, dedicated CockroachDB as our go-for platform for critical database workloads. So a little bit about uh, where we are now. As I mentioned, we've been using um, Cockroach sort of as a one-off for our payment processing. Um, but once we chose Cockroach, we were able to get um, started for, for our critical um, workload project, we were able to get started deploying services rather quickly. Um, we're deployed in a multi-region production deployment. Um, we're having ongoing consulting and training with our customer success team at Cockroach. Um, and I, just as an aside, I, I was talking to the Cockroach DB marketing team yesterday, and they were asking me, you know, if you had one piece of advice you could give anyone who's new to Cockroach DB, I would say. Um, you know, my answer was, take advantage of your customer success team. Um, you know, they're there to help. And um, I think a lot of developers and uh, people in infrastructure think of Cockroach as like a drop-in for PostgreSQL. I know a lot of people have mentioned it. It's like it, but it's not a drop-in. So um, definitely take advantage of the, the assistance from customer success. And we're also evaluating other tier zero services, a tier zero being our critical services for uh, migration to CockroachDB. Um, yeah, so anytime you have a project like this, I think it's important to talk about lessons learned. Um, and these are three of the best, you know, the biggest lessons that we learned as part of this project. The first one is that uh, distributed SQL does require some schema changes. You know, as I was just saying, um, it's like PostgreSQL or, or like a relational database, but there are some small but really important um, changes that need to be made, um, like primary key columns. You need to have the proper primary keys, or you can wind up with hot ranges that like, lead to um, poor performance. So this actually happened to us a couple of weeks ago, and I thought I'd uh, share a little antidote. Um, we had a table in our newest service that we deployed to CockroachDB that had uh, poorly designed primary key. So what ended up happening is that we had a hot range that was um, spiking the CPU on the leaseholder node to 100%. So um, we worked with customer success and they suggested a new primary key um, for this table. So I was talking to a developer the next day after we made the change in production and he said, I, I said, you know, I've been a database administrator and had been for 20 years and just the fact that you can make a schema change online for a primary key for a huge table, it just blows my mind because 
you know, Oracle and uh, SQL Server and databases like that, that's kind of like a no-go. Um, and the thing that he said that I thought was really cool to hear was that, you know, we made this poor design and, it, and basically on a, out of our own ignorance. But the more that I learn about CockroachDB and the way it handles things, the more impressed I am. So, you know, it's really nice to hear that because you invest a lot of time in providing this platform and uh, people seem to be pleased with it at Shipped. So, uh, the, the next thing that is a lesson learned for us is that uh, Cockroach does apply maintenance in a rolling manner, but you need to make sure that your apps are coded to handle the server shutting down messages that are emitted um, when maintenance is happening. And lastly, the, the uh, last lesson that we've learned that I wanted to point out is that, um, so we rely for observability on Prometheus metrics at Shipped. Um, so we're able to pull those metrics um, into our local environment and create alerts and um, you know, charts and graphs and uh, Grafana dashboards on those. And so currently, uh, the managed uh, CockroachDB offering does not expose these metrics uh, where we can get to them. So that, that's kind of like a feature request that we're asking about. And also, uh, CockroachDB does uh, supply alerts that can be configured, but they're not nearly as customizable as we would like. They're kind of like a, here's your threshold, and you can either have it or on or off. Uh, and we like to kind of, the, the CPU issue that I was referring to, you know, once someone asked, is there a way to monitor the divergence of CPU between one node and then the rest of the nodes in the cluster? And there's not really a way to do that. Uh, with a dedicated product, so uh, yeah. So that's, that's one thing that we're working with customer success on is uh, feature requests for those two items. Um, yeah, and that's really all I had today. I wanted to thank Cockroach for inviting me to this, um, to speak at the conference. I've been to a lot of conferences over the years, some really huge ones, and I think y'all have done a great job of making this one like the right size for where we can not be overwhelmed by having to walk uh, from building to building, so good job. Thank you.